Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. We're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. What is up? Hey, how's it going, everybody? We're not sweating today because we're in the throes of a polar vortex. It is It's pretty chilly outside. Yeah. Uh, what is it, like negative something wind chill? I, I think it's, I think in New York, it's closer to just like maybe zero degrees. Single digits. But uh, I really have to, I don't know, shout out our fans in the Midwest. Keep safe. Because it's like minus 60 in some places. That seems so dangerous to yeah. even walk outside. Don't go outside. Quit your job. Uh, don't, no, don't burn qu- everything you own. <laughs> don't quit your job. Don't burn everything you own. <laughs> but definitely stay safe. Um, and stay warm. I'm worried about you. Um, but uh, yeah, how, how's your week been, James? Not too bad. Uh, you know, just chilling. Just chilling. I, you know, speaking of cold, and I didn't tell this story on the podcast, but a couple weeks ago, it was a cold day, and uh, I was on my way to one of the offices that I work at. Uh, I had a coat on. I didn't have any gloves, uh, and I was walking up the staircase, I had my hands in my coat pockets and, uh, you know, my very gangly legs, <laughs> they gave out from underneath no. me. Uh, I missed a step and just, it happened in slow motion. I fell toward the staircase, you know, toward toward a sheer step, you know, Was and there blood? could not, could not, pull my hands out to brace myself so i took it on my forehead luckily i was wearing a hat not this hat not my go hobo hat it probably would have added extra protection because it's quite a sturdy hat but, right but uh, i was wearing another hat and just yeah we just went straight like forehead first into uh but you're okay now James? Into a step i'm did i'm you okay need, did you need stitches I didn't need anything. Okay. I just needed a helping hand. Luckily, there was a kind New Yorker next to me who just like lifted me up and kept walking. That's nice. Um, but I was, yeah, could have been a lot worse. So well, I'm glad you're okay, James. But it gave me the idea for a trillion dollar company. What's that? Uh, I want a coat with um, Velcro attached <laughs> pockets. <laughs> breakaway pockets yeah breakaway pockets at any moment your yeah. hands are free <laughs> imagine well what about pants because i always put my hands in my pants pockets <laughs> i thought you were gonna say rip away pants <laughs> well to which i would have said they they already exist but but pockets that rip away from i mean pants. just imagine if you were to fall but you were wearing rip away pants <laughs> <laughs> and you just ripped your pants off as you braced yourself I mean, it'd probably be better than like busting your head open, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I would definitely take pants, pantless and and unscathed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so that's all, that, those are my only updates, really. Um, so I don't know. There could be some brain damage, but it's too. I don't. I'm too weird to tell. <laughs> so um, I don't know. What about you, Nick? Um, yeah, I've been working, working hard. I think uh, the biggest update is I actually got a new studio. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's exciting. That is very exciting. You know, my, my current studio, it was a nice place to start out. And I, you know, it was a good, like, I don't know, experiment to see if, if it was, like, a thing I, I liked. And uh, I do enjoy having a studio. Uh, but the current one I have doesn't, it's not fully enclosed. Like, the right. walls, it, it's private. No one can come in there, but the walls don't go to the ceiling. Mm. So, you know, we can't do the podcast in there and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited. This new one is like right next to my house. I can just walk there in five minutes and uh, we're going to set up a little podcast studio. And, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, it should be good. It should be good. That's going to be, that's going to be great. Yeah. So now you don't have to fully enclose your MakerBot. No, I mean I'll probably keep it enclosed because it's still nice to have it enclosed. Does but. it does it aid in the, uh, you know, the problem of peeling? Yeah. So yeah, fully enclosing a three D printer helps the build quality, definitely. Um, yeah. Because the new MakerBot has the fully enclosed print printer, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean it helps just kind of retain the heat, keeps it kind of soft and like, you know. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a story about that, but but we'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but uh, should we move on to our design news? Yeah, we have some design news. Um, and I, I saw this on my Instagram feed the other day, and you kind of pointed it back out to me again. But uh, I follow this artist slash designer called Sebastian Erazeres, uh, and that is at Sebastian Studio on Instagram. Um, I'm actually a, a big fan of Sebastian's work. He does a lot of conceptual like furniture pieces uh, and, and art in general. Um, and he posted this image the other mm-hmm. day of of his bookshelf, and it was an image of his bookshelf next to another designer's bookshelf pretty well-known designer that you are familiar with um and he was like calling out the designer saying that that designer had copied him yeah so this is an italian designer fabio november and we actually Which, brought him up in another podcast and, and correct me if i'm wrong is uh, i would argue that fabio november is more uh more famous than sebastian sure he's, he's he's better established right um yeah, I I first first came became aware of Fabio when he did a lot of um it was for some architecture magazine and and I'll have to edit in the name of it when I think of it. But uh he would interview other industrial designers like he interviewed Marcel Vanders or Ito, Konstantin oh, wow. Gurchik. Okay. Like he is not only like a seasoned designer, but also very well connected and like, you know, well regarded within the community of designers. He interviewed these people as an article or like a no, a like video a, as a video. That's cool. Yeah, and there's one of Ross Lovegrove, like you know, just a, a ton of big names. He sits down with, and they're very friendly with each other. It's right. like we're friends, and now I'm interviewing you. Right. Um. So it was interesting to me because I. I enjoy both of their, you know, both of their work. They're both highly regarded as great yeah. artists and designers, yeah. And you know, when I saw Sebastian's post, I I got a little annoyed. Yeah. To well, be honest. And, and first of all, let's explain what these things are. Yeah. So Sebastian Arazer has designed this bookshelf and it's a statue, uh, you know, like an old Greek statue. Yeah, Greek or Roman statue. Uh, and surrounded by this wooden scaffolding yeah and it's kind of like a miniature if if i this is what i like to think of like when they were building the statue of liberty i'm sure that you know you had the statue in the center and then all this scaffolding around it and sebastian has just like miniaturized it and made it a greek statue instead of the statue of liberty yeah but you know he has books up there and you know it's a shelf it's yeah like a, kind of an art piece and shelf right and yeah. then and then fabio's Explain that one, James. Fabio's is more of a traditional bookshelf. And, like your classic IKEA bookshelf. Yeah, and and uh, I mean maybe a bit <laughs> a bit nicer than that. <laughs> a bit more high end, but but uh, there's a statue in kind of in the middle of of the the shelving, almost like it's being sliced. Right. Um, and so, you know, Sebastian's uh, Instagram post reads. Uh, gets copied three years later by a known Italian designer. What a clown. Used to follow me on Instagram. Have texts and emails from when he wanted to come see my new works. And it's like, you know, I sat there and looked at the two images and I was like, okay, okay. <clears throat> there are statues involved. Yes. There's shelving involved. Yes. That Those are the only similarities between the two of them. Correct. And to me... I, you know, from sort of understanding a bit of Fabio's work, I can't say that I understand his philosophy completely, but he's very interested in like the human form. And like he has these chairs that are essentially like Panton chairs, but in, but instead of just the smooth mm. plastic surface, it's like there are bodies imprinted into them. Yeah, we, we talked about that in one of the podcasts. Before. And, um, you know, he also seems pretty concerned with like, sexuality and modesty and all of these things and if you look at his shelf the places where the shelving is is dissecting the statue seem very intentional one you know one is at the eyes of the woman and she's the statue itself is like a woman being sort of like trying to modestly cover up herself right 
And and so there's one kind of at nipple level. There's one at crotch level. Crotch level. <laughs> um, and there's one at her knees. And and whereas Sebastian's just feels like he took a Goliath statue with you know that had all this scaffolding around it and miniaturized it right. to the point where it could be functional as a shelf. Yeah. And so I see like the train the train of thought going into these pieces as very different. Right. Like they're being approached in very different ways. For sure. Yeah, I I can see that conceptually they are very far apart. I think visually, you know, you could draw some similarities, but I also think that for someone to call like for you know, Sebastian's a well-known designer, like for him to call out another well-known designer, I think it was a little bit out of bounds. And don't get, get me wrong, I love Sebastian's work. Yeah. But it, you are right. I feel like it was a, a step too far out of bounds. Um, and we've talked about copying on the podcast a lot. And, um, you know, my my thing is design is all about building off of past inspiration. And if you see something that's similar to your design, like it's it's not that they copied your design or it's not like they stole your design. It's just they're evolving and they might have been inspired or they might not have been from your right. design. And also there's the whole concept of designers in parallel past, which happens a lot fre- fre- more frequently than you would think. Right. Designing the exact same like look and feel of an object. Yeah. And not even knowing about it until both of them release it at the exact same time. Yeah. And and you find a lot in Fabio's work this like sort of reference to the past. Like he has this tray that looks like sort of a I I think I'm stating this correctly, like sort of sort of like an Italian piazza, like a square, like okay. in the middle of a of a, of a like set a, of buildings. Is it like a mini? If it's a tray, is it yeah. like a miniature town square? Exactly. So it's, you know, I I think that it's not out of step for him to do something like this, and I could see how Sebastian's like, oh, this guy was so interested in my work, and now he. Now he's using a statue and shelving and right. I, I don't know, but it was interesting. I was kind of interested to see if Fabio would respond. And he did. And he did. And he said, design paranoids in all caps. <laughs> Dear Sebastian Studio, I appreciate your work. And I even thought we were friendly. Of course, I was wrong. You have been deliberately offensive and your comments shameful. My career speaks for itself. And my blog, Oinoi... Dot .it has explored this topic since you were a kid in school. Oh my god. Uh, I hope your paranoia will not affect the quality of your work. To be a good designer, you need to be a good person. Savage. Yeah. Savage. <laughs> and it is interesting because I knew this about this is another thing that's that sort of like sparked my interest in this whole debate was I was aware of this blog that Fabio has as well as an Instagram. It's I, I don't know how quite it's it's uh, pronounced, but it's I O N O I underscore by Fabio November, and what he does is he takes images of two different designed objects from different times, from different time periods, or or even just like slightly different time periods, and shows how there's sort of this parallel thought mm, yeah. um, and links between works. I mean. I can see, like, go, scroll up, mm-hmm. click on the, this one. The one with the Mark Newson. Yeah, so you have, the, like, the Mark Newson. Is that the Lockheed Lounge chair? Uh, I think it's a complimentary chest or, um, yeah, chest of drawers. Oh, okay. Ne- um, next to, like, drawer. a Victorian chest of drawers that looks pretty much the exact same form, mm-hmm. but just a different material. Right. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. There's even a... Um, a piece here that is one of Fabio's pieces from 2007. And then there's a piece by Karim Rashid in 2008. And they're, they have, they're quite similar. Yeah. It's like a coffee table, but it's like, uh, if you thought of a coffee table as like a ribbon and kind of like threw the ribbon on a ground on the ground and it kind of curled up into a coffee table. Yeah. That's what they both look like. So there's definitely, there's this thing in design and I don't, I don't think it's malicious unless it is a blatant 
one hundred percent rip off. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you start getting into the bad territory when you essentially are a copy machine, right? Like yeah. if you can put a piece of paper in a copy machine and it comes out exactly the same, right? That's a copy. Like right. literally, right? Yeah. Um I, I actually think and I think we've mentioned this before, but I think the rule is eighty percent. Mm-hmm. You're allowed to be eighty percent similar. Yeah. And it's it's pretty uh pretty lenient. I mean what is what is twenty percent difference? Right. I mean, it could be, in in Sebastian's case, I could see that being at least 50%, maybe even 60% different than Fabio's. Yeah. Other people could argue that it's 10% different or, or whatnot. But Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is to, to the normal person seeing these two pieces, they probably would say they're, they're very similar. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, I just think that there's different philosophies and different approaches that are going into these pieces. Yeah. And I also think that for Sebastian, when you go out and accuse somebody of copying, you are you're kind of opening yourself up for criticism yourself. It's kind of like a it's kind of like Isn't there like a game where Oh, like on Scrabble. If you challenge someone in Scrabble and telling them their word is incorrect and they look it up in the dictionary and actually it's a real word, then you get points deducted. Isn't that a thing? Oh, yeah. It kind of feels like that. Yeah. Because I I just, you know, who knows? Like he could, Sebastian as well, could have unwittingly copied somebody's work. I mean, we're all inundated with everybody's work all the time now that you could... You know, you could just be scrolling through on your phone and see something and, and it, not it even realize it, not even realize it. Mm-hmm. It's all um, subconscious. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. I, I don't know if this will go any further, but no, we're, we're probably the only news talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're the best news. That's source, right. Because we're on the beat. This is the, our first design original news. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But uh, James, you made me watch Marie Kondo. <laughs> Transition. Segway. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have heard or seen this new series on Netflix. I'm not a big Netflix user, so everyone, no, well, the, the whole culture thing. Just... There's there's nothing on Netflix. <laughs> Net- Nick. Oh, you, has you should you should you should be watching Netflix. Oh, I was using the wrong one. That's the reason. <laughs> Netflix um, sounds like a series of really painful videos. <laughs> Um, well, there is the tidying up by Marie Kondo Netflix yeah. series, which came out and it's, and James made me watch it because I don't know, you've been cleaning up your house or something. I it's don't know. the reason I made you watch it, Nick, is because I don't want you to always be living under the cultural rock. You need to, you need to know that this is not just a show. It is a phenomenon. Uh, well, you also watched the fire documentary and, uh, yeah, I just, I think, I like to get my culture from you, James. You watch it <laughs> and tell me about it in the five minutes and I'll get Fair there. enough. Um, but I I encourage you to watch it not only because it's a cultural phenomenon, but also because I think that there's an interesting conversation to be had about tidying up, about hoarder, you know, like people who hoard their goods. Yeah. Um and what that's all about, but what? Did, but first of all, what did you think? <laughs> well, well, to be honest, I've actually read the book. I know that's crazy because I'm not a big book reader, but I have read Marie Kondo's tidying up book. Um, when I moved to New York, I was like, I got to get rid of all this stuff. I got to move. Oh. So I was tidying up in Texas, um, and yeah, I thought it was a fine book. I think there was a lot of praise around the book. Right. I. I did you use the philosophy of spark joy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with Marie Kondo, she is a Japanese, I guess, tidying up person. She's a she's organizer, a organizing guru. I guess organizing guru that wrote a book about cleaning your life and getting rid of a lot of things. And kind of the the thesis of the whole book is you pick up an object and you ask yourself, does this bring you joy? Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, you get rid of it. Yeah. Um, it's pretty It's pretty simple. Yeah. I. Um, one of the things that I... So my feeling about the show is 
The show in general, I thought was just okay. And there wasn't, there weren't a lot of, I thought there were going to be more organizational tips. Okay, well. For- <laughs> and and what Marie Kondo does is this, I'm, okay, I'm an HGTV boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let, so let me preface this with that. So I'm used to like dramatic transformations, you know, but what Marie Kondo does, she comes, she comes by, Did you she want- piles all the clothes on the person's bed and then leaves. <laughs> you wanted Marie Kondo to be like, move that bus. <laughs> I wanted, From yeah. Home, home, homemaker. Are you ready to see your fixer upper? <laughs> like I wanted, I wanted like dramatic transformations. I wanted, I like, like new, you know, just like new stuff. Like organizing their lives and well, okay, yeah. So just to be clear: if you haven't seen the TV show itself, it's definitely like a reality kind of vibe, right? Um, she shows up at their door, right? And they and then there are these two hoarders or whoever many. I watched this. I watched a couple that had like two full rooms of Christmas decorations. Yeah. Did you see that one? Oh yeah. Uh, who has that much? It's just yeah. It's one of those shows that it's almost like pleasure shows i guess yeah i don't know i i did i definitely didn't enjoy it but i watched it for you james thank you but i i feel like there are as product designers there's 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 something there that's really interesting which is you know last the last time we had a big topic it was sort of around global design but we started talking about things that are meaningful Mm. and you brought up this idea that An object itself doesn't have to be meaningful at the onset, but given time, it will start to take on a quality of meaning. Right. And for these people in this show, every single thing they've ever touched had meaning to them. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is intense. And I know, like, for myself, trying to go through, and here's the thing about Marie Kondo's show, is regardless of the quality of the show which i think was it was okay i it did it did make a lot of people go and start cleaning like i immediately after watching a couple episodes went and cleaned my closet yeah and one of the things that i really liked was that if you were to throw something out or you know put it in a pile to take it to goodwill the the idea was to thank the item for all that it had done for you. Oh, that's right. Before throwing it away, mm-hmm. which I think is was a pretty useful mindset because because sometimes I do get like sentimental or or feel bad about throwing something out, right? Um, or giving it away, and I like that idea of thanking thanking the object. And then being okay with, you know, you've thanked it. You can now give it away. Yeah. Um, But I don't know. I think it's just, it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon because we do collect so many things over the course of our life and what, what is truly worth bringing, bringing along. And then, yeah, like how do you organize those things? within your life to to make it so that you're not overwhelmed and well i i'll say this i uh so i think this you know i, I moved I, I i read the book in texas the book was fine you know clean all my stuff moved to new york and then i guess i want to say last year i dove down this uh youtube spiral hole of minimalism videos oh and this these videos are about living a minimal lifestyle um there was a documentary i think called minimalism i don't know if you've seen it or not um but you know it's just like talk- i have not it, it i think it was good and it was just it just like follow the the, the, doc- the documentary just follows two guys around the uh, u.s i think and they just talk about how they only have like a bag of clothes <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty extreme but yeah. um you know there's this whole idea behind minimalism and cleaning up your stuff that it's you know it's it's not necessarily that you need to get rid of everything in your home right it's not like you live with a bed and that's it mm-hmm. although i do know some designers that have just a bed is that for <laughs> i mean i'm getting there i'm getting there close but i still have a few things around 
Yeah, but I, for the designers who only have a bed, is that because they can't afford anything else? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's that's different than minimalism. <laughs> it's called being broke. <laughs> that's called forced minimalism. Um. Well. Okay. Yes, but I'm joking. Um. The uh the one thing that's interesting is that it's more about intentionalism, like mm. being being in, very intentional with what you buy what you use what you purchase you know what you have in your house um and i i've definitely since watching a lot of those youtube videos have started to find myself being very very selective on what i purchase Mm -hmm. and and what i add to my life Mm -hmm. um and definitely always uh analyzing what i already have and trying to uh, efficiently get rid of things and streamline my life Mm-hmm. And how have you found that it's well? I, oh, okay. Well, case in point. So here's another here's another thing. And I and uh, on my, th- I watched this one YouTube video where it was talking about your home screen on your phone, and how there's a ton of apps on here, and you just should get rid of them all. Well, check out my home screen on my phone. <gasps> <laughs> for for those of you at home, it is completely black screen. And then I have an iPhone. So at the bottom, you have the four home apps. Mm-hmm. And so I put my message app, my Instagram, and my mail. And then another app that is a folder. And mm-hmm. that folder has all of my other apps. Mm. So essentially, I only have four apps on my, my screen. And they're all at the bottom. And if what, I need are the, it, what are the other dots? Well, those are just apps I downloaded and I forgot to organize yet. So oh, don't fatigue me. <laughs> come on. Um, but it is life-changing, I feel. Uh, how have you found that it is i think it's a it's all about having a clear mind Mm. it's it there's so much noise in our day-to-day life yeah going to work you know people about running getting errands or running errands (laughs) getting 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 running (laughs) errands and doing your laundry all all these things have i don't know i feel like they take a little like tiny little percentage of your brain power right? yeah and so just eliminating any distraction and any kind of extraneous thing in your life can really help alleviate some of that some of that brain power right and that you can utilize for other things yeah that, that's how i feel about it yeah um i don't know no i think that makes good sense i think that Like, the only thing that I would, I guess, have against minimalism is... When I think of minimalism, I think of, I don't know, like a Muji ad or something like that. Mm. Where, like, there's very little decoration on the wall. There's, like, a lack of color. There's, you know, everything is just, like, in its right place and almost in a sterile way. Yeah. And uh, Does my room feel sterile to you, James? No, no. I mean, it's not very tidy. I think, I think uh, you could tidy up a little bit. Okay. I think you need to watch more Marie Kondo. But um, actually, Nick, could you bring your phone out again? Yeah. Now, I just want to point something out here. Now, look at that. Okay, James is pointing to the Instagram app. Right there. Yeah. Where? That's some clutter in your life. Instagram. So, that that brings me to some updates about myself. Yes. Um, because, uh, Myron, the industrial design vlogger, uh, he did a video about, uh, uh, what was it? Oh, right. So you, you, so I, I watched this as well. Myron did a YouTube video about, I guess, deleting Instagram. Yes. How I broke my phone addiction, the distraction free phone. And, um, there was a series of things that happened, uh, at, you know, after he launched this video to me. Are we, are we getting into phone addiction? Because this is a problem for me. So so here's here's what happened. He posts the video. I watch the video. I watch all of Myron's videos. I'm I'm interested in what he's doing. I think he's an interesting kid. I'm I'm very interested in his ambition and his sort of um, what's the what's the correct term for this? Like perseverance. Uh, his his unconventional path tenacity yeah well he, he the unconventional path got it and okay. the tenacity yep all of that um but uh so 
he's talking in the video about having a conversation with somebody and pulling out his phone and then like you know looking at nothing very interesting like it's not like he was looking at anything interesting it was just a, a habit and as he's saying not looking at anything interesting one of my renderings <laughs> goes by and and he doesn't even like it James, in the are video your, are your feelings hurt man i'm oh, sorry oh man i was ticked <laughs> off so i'm i'm like kind of like man why did he you know like he didn't do it on purpose he James. didn't do it on purpose it just happened to be it's what was on his phone when he was filming but then as i'm like kind trying to concoct a response to what's just happened um he posts on instagram and challenges me and you and sam does design to delete their social media apps i did not and at first i was like <laughs> what the flip i was like this youtuber thinks he can come into instagram and boss us around i was peed and and so you know i posted a response i was like it it was it was not even a night before the night before <laughs> that James. i am on a rant right now nick god don't interrupt me the night before we were talking about how much time we spent on instagram it was me oh, you did. and reed we and did. my wife allison and we were looking at our stats mm. cuz you can look at your stats and <laughs> mine was 34 minutes a day on average and do you want me to disclose mine nick <laughs> go ahead i think it's like two and a half hours maybe three maybe three um <laughs> so i was like delete instagram i don't have an addiction um but the thing is as i thought more and more about it i was like well actually the other thing that happened was sam does design posted i i was like there was a difference here for Myron deleting all of his social apps. He can still use YouTube from his desktop, but I, we can't post to Instagram from our laptop. But then I forgot that you can post to Instagram from your iPad <laughs> uh, until Sam does design posted about it. So what I ended up doing was today I deleted Instagram. I deleted all of the social apps off of my phone. What? Are, I, are you coming back? I... To be determined. James, I miss you already, man. I'm on, I'm still on the iPad. I think I'll try okay. and I will think I'll look like once or twice a day. I got it. So you deleted it specifically on your phone and you can still, it's not like against the rules to yeah. look at your iPad. Okay. But here, but here's the other part of it. And uh, Nick, you aren't included in this, but there is, there's another part about Instagram, which is, you know, I was only on for 34 minutes a day and that, Part of that is because I haven't been posting very much. But another part of that is I just generally have been disinterested with the content on Instagram recently. Hmm, that's interesting. And I, so I open it up and I'm like, sketch, render. Okay, I've seen it. I've seen it all. Like huh. I, I, I just can kind of predict what I'm going to see. And there's nothing surprising about it anymore. There's nothing like... Do you scroll through every single photo, though? <sighs> Nick, the, now, if you don't know this about Nick and you're offended that he doesn't follow you, here's... yeah, here, Take it okay. away, Nick. <laughs> well, as you guys know, I have a Instagram addiction. Um, the first step is admitting it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nick. I actually, I actually will say, after we chatted that one night, I did set up my uh, screen time app so that it cuts me off. Okay. But I also... Because I had it on for a while where it says like, oh, you've spent two hours, you know, snooze for 15 minutes. And I always click the snooze button. Mm -hmm. So then I keep scrolling. I set it up this time so that there is no snooze button. It will shut off my apps. Yeah. And I have to go into the settings to change it. Uh, and hopefully I won't do that. Hopefully that's enough abrasion to stop me from that. And if that, if I do reach level where I'm going to the settings app every single time and changing, oh, and changing no. the rule, then I'll have to have someone, maybe you, a trusted friend, to enter to create a <laughs> pin code for my phone oh no all right uh yes if i i actually have a few friends actually quite a few that i don't follow on instagram and it's not because i don't love you guys you guys are amazing friends and 
the problem is, is that, like I said, I'm addicted. So I'm trying to like very, very carefully streamline my content that I consume. And the reason is because I see every single photo that everyone's posted until the last time I checked Instagram. Mm -hmm. So if I haven't checked it all day, I'll sit at home for 30 minutes and scroll to the very last photo I saw yesterday. Yeah. Until it says like, you're all cut up. Yeah. Which some of you have never seen. There's a, there's a thing that says you're all cut up. When you he f- reaches the bottom. Yeah, he's, I reached the bottom. He, he essentially, he's, he is a flat earther uh, <laughs> reaching the ice wall. I guess so. If you want to. <laughs> I am going to, I am going to say it like that. Um, but I will, I will say that today after deleting uh, Instagram for How do you my feel? Phone, How do you feel? I mean, today there was a lot of like, the like the muscle memory of like going mm. to 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 open up right. the app was still there so i think it is going to take some time to break away from it did you like my photo at least first or no no oh dang it no i didn't um but yeah like i said i'm still going to check it i think i'm going to check twice a day but i just i don't really have anything to share at the moment and i'm I just kind of don't want the image overload. I feel like I have, there's way too much in, image overload in my life between Pinterest and Lemonouche and Instagram. It's It becomes one of those things where I start to feel like I really have to, I don't know, try to intentionally block all of that stuff out of my view and out of my right. mind to do something original. Yeah, I I personally, I, I've never been a huge person to do the Pinterest thing and the Lemonouche thing. Um, I only, I barely use my Pinterest. I usually occasionally if if I need to like do some some inspiration boards and things like that. But um, I I think that's a good plan, James. Like there there is definitely value in putting getting rid of all of this noise. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm too scared to do it. Here's the thing is like I could have this, you know, this feeling right now and then be back on Instagram next week or or tomorrow. Who knows? But I think I'm going to try it out for a little bit. How how long? A week? Tomorrow? Uh, Are you going to give yourself th- a date? I think I'll give. I kind of want to follow up now. I want. I think I'm going to do a month. A month? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm still going to be <laughs> again. <laughs> Again, okay. I'm so bad. Breathe, Nick. Breathe. Already... Breathe. Um, I think you know. Again, the iPad. I'm not completely disconnected. Okay. And I can check Instagram from my computer, but I just, uh, I don't know. I just want to like get off of there, and I just want to focus on things that I actually want to focus on because I tend to get in this. I tend to get in the cycle of like, uh, like what what should I do for Instagram next? Yeah, that's and, a yeah. I, I, I find d- myself there too as well. Yeah, and I don't. I want to break out of that, and I just want to do work that I'm legitimately interested in investigating, and that I don't have to be constantly worrying about documenting for likes. Yeah, I don't know. So, amen. <laughs> that was good should we get to some questions yes we should get to some questions um well if you guys aren't if, if you haven't listened to like the past three episodes we have a voicemail we google, have a voicemail google voicemail call us up don't, we won't answer we won't answer don't be scared yeah it'll go to voicemail and you can leave us a message you can say hey we love the show hey we hate the show or <laughs> hey we have a question and this person left a hey i have a question Oh, they're anonymous, so we'll just uh, give it a play and then. Hi guys, I just want to see how much dilemma I'm facing right now. I am a senior, I've been graduating in June, but I'm not going to be taking classes next term from April until June. And I'm trying to decide whether I should take that time just to focus on building my design portfolio and looking for industrial design jobs or go find. Uh, some kind of job not related to industrial design to uh, save up the nest egg so that when I find an industrial design position, I can go travel to interview and have some money to relocate. 
guys have any thoughts, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, so essentially this person has a period of time where they're they're not really in school, mm-hmm. going to be graduating in June, but they're not taking classes uh, the entire spring semester. So they're trying to decide on what's the best use of their time. Should they go and get kind of a, a paying job, Joe Schmo job to get um, some money to save up, pay off those loans, mm-hmm. get ready to relocate? Or uh, should they be investing time in their portfolio? Both. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they're mutually exclusive for sure. Yeah, I mean, unless you're working the old twenty-four hour shift, uh, I think um, you know this is one of those things. Is and I struggle with this as well. Is is sometimes I feel like if I don't have carved out dedicated time for something, I can't achieve it. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I I definitely used to have that feeling, especially with the portfolio, because the portfolio is something that you can just mull over for, oh my gosh, for the rest of your life. Yeah. Portfolio is never finished. No. Um, Until you die. And I don't know. I, I think I think you probably have the better advice for portfolio building than I do, Nick. What is my advice? I, I oh. don't know. That's what I'm curious about. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you, you said it in a way of like, I know what your advice is. I think your advice is better. Uh, no, I think, um, yeah, I, I would say... Certainly, you should work on the portfolio, and you know it. There is this kind of weird stage that everyone goes through of like they're working on their portfolio, they have a few solid projects, and they want to start applying to jobs. But then there's always that thing in the back of their head, like, oh, but the portfolio is not really finished yet. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it's finished enough to send out, but it's not like finished, good finished, right? Mm-hmm. And what I had to say to that is, it's it's okay, I think to send out your portfolio if it's kind of unfinished. It, not not unfinished in the way that it's like there's typos and things, but, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, I have that one project from my one class that I haven't really prepared yet for my portfolio. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wait till I finish preparing that project in order to send out my portfolio. And the problem is that they're not going to, they're not going <laughs> to, they're not going to yeah. finish it. Yeah. Um. So just apply. I would say just apply. Apply, apply, apply. It's a numbers game, honestly. Yeah. This is the thing that that I well, I get I'm already getting passionate about it, as you can tell. I <laughs> <laughs> I think you should just really just shock an approach. Like be open to any place in the world to go get a job. You know, be open to any company in the world. I know there's the that that one corporation that's like really bland and you don't want to work for them and they all they make is toilet brush holders and you just don't want to do a toilet brush holder. But guess what? That is still industrial design. Yeah. And someone needs to design an amazing toilet brush holder. Yeah. Um so yeah. Wasn't Johnny Ives' first job designing toilets or something? Have I, I said that on the podcast before? I don't know. I think Johnny Ives was working at Tangerine, but I don't know if that was his first job. Mm. Tangerine Studio in in England, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's... I think it's definitely wise to get a job to save up because, yeah, you might have to do some traveling. And if you don't have the money to travel, then yeah, do what you can. I Yeah, and, and every company is different. I will say that if the if you're applying to anywhere in the country or the world... A lot of times, if you are good enough and and the company is not located in like New York City or San Francisco, if it's located in somewhere remote, they will usually pay to fly you out. Right. Um, New York's a little bit of an exception because it's just so saturated, and you know, if you don't want to come for an interview, there's plenty of other designers yeah. around that will. Um, but but yeah. Yeah, here's an out of the box solution. Okay, I'm ready or for outside it. of the box. I'm ready for it. Uh, find the place that you want to live okay. that has industrial design work that you're interested in. Okay, and f- find a job there <laughs> so that you can live and work in that place while also being within range to go. And go on interviews and so, things like that. So you're saying find the coffee shop job yes. in New York so that you can... I disagree. 
<laughs> I don't like that plan. Is it even possible? I don't like that plan. Why not? I would much rather you guys find a coffee shop in your hometown, mm-hmm. you know, live with your parents, save up money, pay off your loans, do it Fair that enough. way. Fair be- enough. Before you go up to New York and spend a ton of money. Yeah. But I think if you're worried about being able to do the, to work the job and also build a portfolio, then like break out your portfolio into manageable chunks. Yeah. There, first of all, that is not a worry. You shouldn't worry about that. If you're worrying about that, that means you're lazy or something, right? Yeah. If you, I mean, you can work an eight hour job and put at least three hours a night on your portfolio. You could do, you could do a page a night, a spread a night. Right. You know, you just break it up, make it manageable. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I definitely had the struggle when I was in school to put together my portfolio, and it like took me way too long. And then looking back on it, I I made terrible portfolios. That's the thing is, people spend all this time on portfolios, and then you know, six months later, it sucks because your yeah. designs have improved so much more. Step one: drop in sketches. Step two: drop in models. Step three: drop in render. Step four, print and send. Guys, no. <laughs> also, also, can we... I, I've been thinking about this for a while now. And we're, I know we're going on a little tangent here, but g- give me a chance. Give Nick me a chance. Gets, Nick get, gets fired up about portfolios. <laughs> can we just get rid of PDF portfolios altogether? Can we just all use Behance or Squarespace mm. or Coreflot? Because PDF portfolios make me so angry because all, all students do with PDF portfolios is they... You know, they're like sitting and their professor has told them to make a PDF portfolio so they can send out to the, these employers. And they're like, yeah, I made a PDF portfolio. Oh, crap. There's this thing called Behance. Well, let me just upload my PDF to Behance or mm. upload my PDF to, to Squarespace. Right. Yeah, that is the thing. And unless you're like a graphic design wizard and can make it work in both formats. But the the yeah, the other thing that's weird about digital PDF portfolios is that oftentimes, I mean, I remember designing spreads in portfolios and it's like, you get that you get that digital one and like, you're not looking at things in a spread format. It's and, a, and if you do, spread. it's like, it's you so know, tiny. it's so tiny. It's like watching a, a cinematic movie with the black bars on, it makes on like an so airplane. It make, oh gosh. Yeah. It's uh, anyways. Okay. That's all I had to say. But yeah. should we get to the next question? Let's get to the next question. All right. We have a question ca- that came in from the email. Oh, also, if you wanted to send in a voicemail, the number is 1-646-494-4011. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also have an email called minordetailspodcast at gmail.com, which you can send your questions to. And this one comes from R- R- Ran Abe. And they say, hey, Nick and James. Hope you two could help me out. I graduated eight or nine years ago in product design from a university. And when I tried to get into the university, it was difficult because of the recession. I interned at a few studios but never gained employment due to the financial climate. So I ended up falling into packaging slash graphic design. For a while, I've been feeling unhappy and was looking to get back into product design slash industrial design. Do you have any tips on how to get back into the industry or do you know of anyone that has made that jump? Yeah, we've gotten similar questions before and I'm trying to think if I know anybody who has made that jump. I think the unique thing here with this question is that they graduated with industrial design, but all their experience has been pro- uh, packaging slash graphic. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's there's been times where it's like oh i was i was working in industrial design and then i got this graphic design job or you know such and such um this one's interesting because it's like they've been almost a decade doing graphics slash packaging right and how do you transition from that into industrial design okay well so our our sort of typical answer to this would be start doing side projects or right. or whatever I'm going to I'm going to do another out of the box okay, outside I, the box. I have another out of the box one too, but I want to hear yours first. Okay. My my thought is I know a lot of firms in New York City especially where they do a lot of beauty packaging. Mm. So it's like yeah, they do packaging design in sort of the cardboard sense, but they also do physical product in terms of the bottles. 
if you could get into a place that has packaging and industrial design under the same roof, then you can start to make inroads into yeah. you know that other that other side of things. Okay, that's what I was going to say as well. Oh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, cuz I you know, I think about like you're saying the beauty industry has beautiful like designed perfume bottles or, yeah. or lipstick things which are hard products like they're injection molded and and some of them are glass and things like that and if you can slowly work your way up there and say oh hey you know i could do the packaging and then also i have some ideas for the, the actual bottle itself yeah um and you can i don't know kind of transition that way yeah i think that would work out you and know. then and then of course you know like james you said just start doing your side projects right hone, hone those product skills but I mean, if you can, if you can find a firm like that, maybe, maybe you don't need to, you know, maybe you could make that transition, but I, I think, think, if I think you, it's like how fast you want to transition. Yeah. And, and also if you, if you haven't been sort of exercising the, uh, the ID muscle, you know, like maybe, maybe you need to get back into sketching or, right or whatever, then, then that's definitely a step that you need to take. Like, I don't know if you've touched CAD in a while, uh, you know, start start yeah. experimenting, yeah. start working on that. Yeah, if you don't know the hard skills, that's a a big step as well. Yeah, gotta learn gotta learn three D modeling. Right. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, Nick. All right, you want to read it? Yeah, this comes from and please excuse <laughs> my pronunciation. Gojun. I was gonna say Gojun. Uh, G O U J O N. I'm sure I, I think um, you were actually more, more right than I was. <laughs> my question is for you and James. Well, thank you. Uh, to discuss how you and James dealt with social life during college and then during the transition into industry. Is there anything you would advise on GF or no GF? Haha. <laughs> ha. Well, I had no GF, but that was not for lack of trying. <laughs> James. Oh. <laughs> break break out the violin, Nick. Um uh that's an inter- that's a fun question. I like this question. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I think gen well, well I I definitely had a GF. I had two girlfriends in college. Whoa, at the same time? <laughs> no. No, Gosh, they were separate. Wow. No. That's um, multitasking. It, I think you can, uh, anonymous uh, voicemail guy, I think you can get your portfolio together and have a job and two girlfriends, okay? Okay, okay. I, 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 I <laughs> you've <laughs> flustered me up now. I can't talk. Um, yeah, I, I definitely felt like I had a, a solid social life in, in college. I think the social life was very in tandem with the studio life right like you're hanging out with all your friends working in the studio building models hang you know sketching having fun um so i don't think you have to like compromise on that Mm -hmm. um i think the the significant other part of the equation is something that you kind of have to take take as it comes i I'm not gonna like recommend that like you go out and get a girlfriend during college yeah i think or that you break up with your girlfriend exactly I i think it's just something that it happens on its own and yeah. you just you know just g- go with what your heart feels i'd right. say <laughs> so, so sentimental <laughs> I, it seems we right, will right. be uh selling uh <laughs> gift cards soon with some of those nick baker sentimental uh you know notions yeah yeah um, uh, but um yeah i think uh well here's here's the thought is like eventually if you're going to have a girlfriend or a wife when you know you start working then maybe it's time like if it happens then maybe it is time to figure out how to balance work and life oh that's good you know? it's like practice this is yeah absolutely uh i wouldn't ever section things off and say like i just need to focus on design right now i mean we all know those those people that spent all their time in studio and and it's like you just got to get out there. You got to experience life. Yeah. Because like life will, you know, funnel itself back into your work. Like right. get out there, see the world, 
Like it's just going to make your work better. And yeah, drink with your with your, you know, your classmates. But don't drink and use a table saw. Yes. That's bad. No. Do don't not do that. do that. Um and then the other part of this one which I feel like I have a little bit more uh say in this 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 area is the transition after school. Hmm. Was there any transition for you after school? Cuz there were definitely was for me. In what way? Well, and I think maybe this is where where I had the unique view on this is that, you know, my my goal was to just get an industrial design job anywhere, and I moved to Texas, and there really wasn't the design culture in Texas. Right. So going from this studio environment where I was for four years of like hanging out, designing all the time, being with all these cool designers, and then going to Texas where it's like, hey, uh, designers, where are you? <laughs> I go, I go, I go. Uh, it was a little bit, I don't know. I, I definitely missed it. And I think that was a big reason that I moved to New York was because yeah. I, I missed that social aspect of design and, and kind of that, that lifestyle. Right. But yeah, I very much tie my social life with design. I don't know how many friends I have that aren't really into the creative industry, <laughs> which is kind of a bad thing. I, I feel there's, there's a little bit of bad there's something bad about that mm-hmm. because I think it is good to have a, a diverse set of friend groups because, right. You know, I mean, I, I will say that's something that was good in Texas. I met a lot of people that were like not necessarily to industrial designers. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, those are the people that are going to give you the real, the real honest these those are feedback the, about design. And those are the people that are buying your products and, yeah. use, and using your products. Exactly. You don't want to be designing to impress designers only. Right. Um, cause that's a very small market. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, my transition, I, I came directly to New York. I had an internship at quirky, which had, you know, there were a ton of cool designers there. Yeah. And then I went to lifetime brands, which another big team of really cool industrial designers. So like, yeah, I, it was, I mean, it was almost I would say that tr- the transition and getting into that and like meeting new designers, it was seamless. I, it was it was seamless and a lot of fun. Um, like especially because in school you're only really working around people at your same age and same level. Mm. When you get out of the working world and you're working with all all ages of right. designer, it's it's kind of fun. You can really grow a lot more from that. I think too. Absolutely, I think so. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, if you guys have questions again, send them into the podcast, uh, Gmail, minor details podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out of the week. Shout out of the week. Uh, I, my roommate sent me this, this Instagram handle and I know you're not on Instagram anymore, James, which is so crazy to me, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, their handle is at Matt Chiama and that's M A T T C H I M. A M A, and I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. There is a lot of CG CGI artists or like animators on Instagram who will, you know, they take very geometric shapes. Maybe it's a sphere or something, and then they have some sort of like hammer that comes down and smashes a sphere, and it turns into like a cube or something. It's very like mm. concept art animation, yeah. or like something. It like I would say they're very satisfying very because satisfying. like things. Things happen um, perfectly. Perfect. Every, yeah. Every single time. It's like slicing something perfectly to yes. like to fall into two perfectly shaped holes. Yes. Well, this guy, I don't. I don't know if we should spoil it or not, but this guy is doing something a little bit different, and I think you guys will love it. Yes. So go out. Go check out at Matt Chihama, yeah. who, who does this beautiful satisfying videos with a little twist yeah just wait until the end (laughs) it is quite delightful um and yeah i I, you know we urge you guys to give your input we're not the experts on all things design there's many other opinions out there so definitely you know send out your your uh, comments on our instagram uh posts or through the voicemail or whatever it is Mm -hmm. um our intro and outro music is by kiyoshi the kid Mm mm-hmm of course, uh, we're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Go go rate. Go like and rate those things. Yes. 
like subscribe do we need to do anything on youtube like do we need to comment on youtube will that boost our views um yeah i i would imagine yeah <laughs> i mean that's another great place for the conversation to happen in the so, comments so like subscribe hey and if you haven't already tell your friends about us that's a good one too tell your friends um and as always i'm at nick p baker and i'm at i draw receipts peace out guys later